Well, <coughs> see if it works here. Yeah. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here as, uh, as an old guy in this very young forum and uh, with a lot of knowledge. And I think uh, so very important knowledge today. And uh, it is, we are in a period of a lot of challenges, especially for the traditional industry, how to take advantage of all the digital uh, instruments we have that we can put into our traditional products in order to service the customers. And uh, <clears throat> coming from a very traditional engineering industry where the product was everything and uh, the customer had to take what we produced. We said, okay, we know better than you what you need and uh, the customer started to run with it, got some problems, and uh, then we told them, okay, you're not using the product in the right way. Uh, so we found out we had to teach the customer. Gradually, you can say, in the, uh, we started, the, uh, that was early 90s, uh, we were on IBM, but we went on the saw in our engineering side, the specification system we built ourselves. Uh, we couldn't find good suppliers, so we started to build up a substantial IT competence inside the group. With uh, the instruments with the, uh, we had at that time, uh, IT systems, and uh, comparing at that time 20 years ago and we today, it's a quite different world. It's a wonderful world we have come into. But it has also changed the way we have been looking upon our business. And I will take it more from a general point of view. You know all the details and uh, I, uh, I will present a little bit of the general thinking uh, we have applied throughout the years here to get uh, the best possible effect of all digital instruments. We have been able to put into our product and to make them more and more advanced over the time. I mean, as a business idea, we have said we have to grow the company with stay, uh, and stay focused, but we can do it just with growing with the customers and with optimal transportation solutions. That is what the customer is, is buying from us, not a hardware, a truck. Uh, in fact, in many times, the customer doesn't know that he, he needs a good transportation solution. It was not so often on the agenda 20, 25 years ago. Today it is. And I would say this is the only way we have found to run the company with the EBIT margins between 10 and 15 percent in the engineering industry. Uh, we have never been in a loss year in this company. The last one was, yes, we were in 1934. We made a loss. <laughs> Since then, no losses. Even in, uh, during the time of Lehman Brothers and the crash there, we, were, we could stay profitable. What it goes about, <clears throat> and what uh, we say is, is to find a balance of uh, the product offering out to a customer, to uh, give the customer very good revenues, and uh, also to uh, a good cost for the customer, because the customer has to stay profitable over the time. And uh, product is one part, but a lot of services is another part we can supply to him. And when you see here, it's, uh, we have the hardware, the traditional hardware, uh, but we also have repair and maintenance, all the service products, financing, but we can also supply a lot of information out to the customer. And if you take the two, we know high profitability to the customer means also high profitability for us when it comes to the customer. We introduced a system 
20 years ago to measure the customer profitability for each individual customer. And some customers, we said after that, we don't want to service you because you can never pay our service and our products. It's better you go to somebody else. Maybe a little bit rude to tell a customer that. But uh, in uh, most of the B2B industry, you can say uptime, flexibility, and then when it comes to the cost for operation, uptime is very critical. There you have the revenue stream into the customer, and uh, uh, we tend to forget that part of the business. How do we understand the customer? Well, we found out that uh, to understand the customer was one part, but in the business to business, it's also to understand the customer of our customer. To find out what parameters are important for the buyer of the transport that is affecting our product offering. And we also found out that these parameters are uh, very unique from customer to customer. And that means we have to, we have been forced by the market and the customers we have to go in for customer unique solutions and product offerings, both in hardware and software. Here is one big customer, Carrefour in France. We learned a lot from them. They were very open. They said, we want to collaborate with you to find out with what is the best support we can get from you and from the transport company we are using. They used, in many cases, their own logistic uh, operator. Here is... Uh, a little bit uh, where the money comes in, where the money, money goes out. And uh, we made with a lot of uh, companies uh, the same analysis, just to learn ourselves. What are the conditions the customer is, the customer of the customer, our uh, transportation company? What are the conditions they are working under? So, uh, uh, what we have done throughout the years here is that, uh, you can say when I started at the company, it was just hardware, it was a product. Steel, just steel in different uh, forms that we put to a product, some plastic, then uh, we started to uh, also find out that we were giving away a lot of service to the customers. We never charged the customer for it. We just said, yeah, okay, it's included in the price, in a way. But uh, with today, and we are in the moving up uh, to... Uh, uh, where we probably will sell just uptime to customers. We started to charge the customer for the service package. We were building in more and more intelligence in the product so we could read exactly in every minute, second, what the truck was doing, speed, uh, load factors, how the driver was behaving in the product. And then we invented something, and it was a type of a mobile phone, a communicator, that could uh, uh, be uh, connected to the mobile network we have, and we could then follow the vehicle uh, much better than before. In the beginning, the customers said, told us, we don't like this, uh, we don't understand it. So we said, okay, you get the free of charge, you can use it for half a year or one year, and after one year, they said, with all the information they got, oh, 
we want more. And we are also prepared to pay for it. What was good for us was that we could see and detect with the product when the brakes were going down or the oil temperature in the engine was a little bit too high, that now something will happen with the vehicle. And we, could, we can then, with this, this information, call in the vehicle. Uh, you say, okay, we book a time for you where you are, the closest workshop, and uh, go there because you have to fix it. Or when you come home, you probably can read to your home, uh, write to your home destination with the, the truck. But there you have to visit the workshop. And we also have exactly the history of every single vehicle. And we also know the absolute specifications. So we can order the spare parts in advance. We could say, send out the scorecard or the history of the vehicle to the workshop. So they could just take it in, take the vehicle in, and start to fix it. And it means a lot for the uptime. And I would say that uh, we have become so much more sophisticated in recent years with uh, all the sensor technology. We have sensors in so many places in, in the truck. We have uh, management systems for the engine, for the transmission. We build it also together for the whole vehicle. And we tap it from information. One of the problems we have today is the huge uh, data we get in to sort out what is relevant information and what is not relevant information. But that's a problem for us. We also see in the development side, and we had an uh, electronic guy uh, who took over as a chief uh, technical officer for for an engineering company that was uh, 2000, and they were absolutely shocked. All the mechanical engineers in the company, they said, oh, how can we bring in, how could we bring in an electronic guy, knowing nothing about, uh, uh, let's say, steel and uh, uh, how to design, uh, let's say, the traditional product. And we said that, you know that, but we need new competence. And we also told them there will be much more silicon in a product in the future. And the combination of silicon and steel, that is what we have to develop further to the best of the customers for their profitability. We move quickly into uh, selling uptime with uh, as a product hardware and a lot of software in a service organization, financing around the world. And we can follow the products so well today, so we know much better than the customer knows about how the product is performing for a certain type of operation. And we can guide the customer and tell the customer, you have to change the specification of your vehicles in. Uh, here and there on the vehicle, then you get out more productivity of the vehicle. We um, have gone further into very many different applications just to understand the customer demands. And what you see here is how we build our products together. And uh, Understand what are the business drivers, you can say in the mining, you can take in the forest industry, uh, also in public transportation out in various cities in the world. And the more we understand of that, the better we can tailor make a complete product of hardware and software to the customer. What is uh, one of the outcomes of this is uh, when we have the vehicle, we have drivers, we have a lot of follow-up, we can go into the maintenance programs. 
we can uh, take on an advisory role to the customer. It's not so that we want to go into it, but uh, in the beginning, but we have found out this is probably the most profitable part. If I take the profitability today of the cost, uh, of, uh, for the uh, company, it's just one third coming from the vehicle. Two thirds of the profitability is coming from the whole service package and financial package and the um, consultancy um, services we are giving to customers. We started here with uh, uh, having vehicles connected. I think uh, today there are more than 250,000 trucks connected, or 270. And uh, they are connected with the network, mobile network. We see exactly where they are and what to do. And uh, <clears throat> then we said it was one of the first applications because we found out that fuel for most of the vehicles, that is about one third of the cost for a vehicle. Another one third is the driver here in Europe. If you go outside Europe, it's a different, it's, it, it is a different split up. We said, can we, can we do online driver training? Connect with the driver in his daily operation and uh, tell him, okay, we see the following behavior from you. And uh, if you change a little bit here and there, and gave instructions when he was uh, is braking, accelerating. Uh, we can, uh, we believed we could change the behavior. Uh, in the beginning, all the drivers were almost dead against it, but uh, their bosses, with a the follow-up, they said that okay, individually I can see, for each individual in the company, who is delivering less cost than others in the driving operation. We could also see it on the maintenance side because uh, bad drivers also require more maintenance of the vehicles. It is just so. Um, we also put up an R&D central, our own transport company to learn how to apply all the digital um, instruments that, we, that was coming here, how to apply that. And uh, we had in the beginning, I think, uh, 20 holy strikes. We have some 40, 50 today. Uh, with uh, 90 drivers, it's 150 drivers today, all brands in because we wanted to see the technology we are developing on the soft side with uh, all the digital equipment. How does that affect uh, also other brands? Can we utilize it or can we see what they are doing uh, to learn? They are driving um, quite a bit, 400,000 kilometers a year. Uh, each vehicle, it's very, very much more than a car. And um, with the driver training evolution and evolution program, you can say the normal fuel consumption for 400,000 kilometer and with in uh, uh, freight transports was when we started with this, and we see it. Uh, in our own transportation company, but also when we apply this knowledge out to, to Carrefour and others, we see more or less exactly the same pattern. Fuel consumption, 122,000 liters a year, is, is quite a bit. You can, you can drive your own car many, many years on 122,000 liters. And um, the cost, 134,000 euro, roughly, diesel fuel. I think that's roughly today. With this training, we could bring down the fuel consumption with 20% to 94, 
95,000 litres a year, almost 20%. Saving in fuel cost, and uh, what many of were discovering when they had been utilizing our di digital technology and the connected vehicles. So this is very good because our EBIT margin is normally just uh, one and a half, two, three percent. And you can say with these saving, I pay more or less the whole wage for the driver. This one thing, the other one is the CO2 reduction for a vehicle like this, 76 ton. And the best drivers, 86 ton. And uh, <clears throat> here we discovered another thing, and that is there is a gender difference here. Almost all best drivers, we have about one-third female drivers and two-thirds male. Almost all of the best drivers are, are women drivers. <laughs> uh, driving, in a way, much, 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 much softer, but with the same average speed. Much more careful. And, uh, well, one uh, track operator told me, I want m more women drivers, I, um, and I'm prepared to pay them an extra bonus. <laughs> it's, a, it's very interesting in the mining industry with all the Caterpillar equipment, <coughs> Volvo equipment there. They also have discovered that there is a gender difference. Very many of the mining companies, when they have a possibility, they prefer women as drivers. It, it takes down the costs. But I mean, what I'm showing here is John, just one application of uh, that we can connect vehicles. We have a lot of sen sensors reading the information about the vehicle. And it gives cost savings, but it also gives a good saving for our dear nature in less CO2, which is also as important. And I would say that what we have seen here is that with uh, uh, all the digital equipment we can put on and connect the vehicles today, this is the best way, way to save our nature. It is. We also see it in the production. If I take uh, the energy production we used for building a vehicle in the beginning of the 90s, before we started really to look upon all the waste, we could follow the waste factors with more sophisticated instruments. We were then on some 35 megawatt hours per truck. Today we are on eight megawatt hours per truck. And it's thanks to our digital equipments reading a lot of information that we can collect and better, far better understand the processes. So also here, this new IT technology is in the manufacturing, is really working for to the benefit of our nature, less CO2. Well, there are other ways of doing it too. Driver training, you see biofuel. Uh, this has been the best selling instrument out to our transporters. They see it immediately in the pocket, and it's a lot of money. If, if you have a saving of some 30,000 euro a year, and you have 100 trucks, it's a, for them at least, it's a lot of money. 
So <clears throat> what we, with all these connected vehicles, all the IT we have put in, what we are saying is that we create a win-win-win situation. A win for the customers of transport. They know far better how to plan the logistic, how to fill up the vehicles. Today, or let's say normal has been some 40-45% uh, that we are filling up the vehicles. But uh, in a few years time, five, six, seven years time, when we get better system support in the, log uh, uh, the log logistic operators, we can probably reach up to 80-85%. And that means that the CO2 exposure <coughs> per ton kilometer, one ton freighted one kilometer, will be reduced with 50%. And you here, you will supply this industry <laughs> with the tools we need to do that. And I'm very optimistic. We have benefit, benefits for customers. They gain money on this. Better profitability also for Scania. And as I said, for our environment. So, what we do then is, with changing, gradually changing, developing our business model, and I would li like to emphasize how important it is to see all the new possibilities, business possibilities coming up with better IT, systems uh, and uh, you also need architecture with vehicle, you need to take care of it in a good way <clears throat> to, to develop your business model from the very traditional one to move close to the customer and say that the relationship we have with the customer that is to create a full product offering that creates, creates a win-win situation for us as a supplier and for the customer as a user of the vehicle. And that is what builds a sustainable relationship over the time. And from that, we live both of us very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leif. And what really strikes me, and I think most of us, is uh, what a pioneer Scania has been when it comes to all the things that all the companies in the industry talk about now. Partnering with the customers, sh share data, and really help the customers' profitability, understand their customers. Just, you know, uh, is that the way you feel it too? Have you been 10, 15 years ahead of what everyone speaks about now? Uh, well, uh, uh, for sure we have been a little bit ahead of uh, our competitors, but I mean, for us it has been it has been a journey, and we we said very early, and it has been also in the culture of the company that we have to be we are there for the customers. But the trigger for this, we have we have had a very good cooperation with Toyota. Uh, in Japan, where we learned the real lean manufacturing and lean manufacturing thinking. And I asked uh, an old guy there, Eiji Toyoda, I sold a company to him, a forklift company uh, in Sweden, to Toyota Material Handling. And I, I, I asked him, it was around 2000, he was an, an old Japanese gentleman, he was put into the company in 1954. Toyota in 1954 was manufacturing 40,000 cars. Volvo in Sweden manufactured 65,000 cars at the year. But I said um, 2000, I'm pretty proud of what we have been achieving here. Now we are on 6 million. Well, that's, a, that's a pretty good journey. 
And I asked him, what's behind this? Well, he said, we have a basic philosophy in this company. We are here for the customers. Customer comes always first in all development we are doing, and also how we take care of the customers. Number two, people. You have to respect people, and you have always to look for that no human is damaged or hurt by the car or in the manu manufacturing process or in the society in general. And third is quality. We took that with us and said, okay, that was 2000, something new for us, customer first. We had never been thinking like that. So we said, if we go in that direction now and start to understand the customer, really understand the customer, just not what the salesmen were telling us, no, to start to measure what can we learn from all the data we get in. And I have to say there were some very, very surprising discoveries uh, that we never heard from the SAIS organization that we started to discover when we started to measure. And on the journey we are. So you can say the trigger that is this old man, Eji Toyota. Interesting is that uh, I asked him, what's your target in your life? I would like to become 100, he said. I'm 85 now. And he passed away when he was 100 years and one week. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing to say. I think we all should say that today. I want to be 100. Uh, okay. Toyota, you were inspired by the Japanese way of thinking in Toyota way. You, you adopted that, become very profitable. Now that all the industry and all the truck company thinks about the same, you know, the truck is more than a product, you have to think about it, um, solution services. Are you afraid that Scania has been caught up or what's the next uh, strategy you have to apply to, to be still ahead of the competitors? <coughs> next wave. I think it's to, uh, 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 to fully understand how you can you utilize all the digital technologies and systems being developed and how to apply them into your business model and develop the business model further on. And it's, uh, the pace is, is much, much harder today or quicker today than it was in the past. And that means uh, the risk here is that people become a little bit complacent, uh, saying, okay, we are the best, we are very good. I think uh, to keep the push in the organization, okay. that, and that was what the, uh, the old uh, Toyota told me. We were talking about quality defects and all that. And he said, you have to remember, I've been working 40 years, he was the honorary chairman in the company. And he said, the, bo the best inspiration I have had, that is to get all the problems on the table from the customer, from inside the company. Because in, if you have that open atmosphere in the company, without seeing the problems and understanding them, you can't improve. Each problem is the best source for or possibility for an improvement. A very, very simple philosophy. We have taken that to our hearts. Uh, you certainly have. And that about the culture and the day-to-day, -day, you know, struggling. But do you also see some big game changes? I mean, we can read every day what's happening in the car industry. So on the product side with electricity and on the business model side, should you own your car in the future? Is it the same in the truck industry that you it's see revol revolution coming on? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's a similar development. Mm. But I think uh, with, in the business-to-business -business world, you, there you are confronted with customers that make money on your products, where uptime is very important, reliability is very important, and you have an uh, income statement where you can read a bottom line. <laughs> For a private person, you never read a bottom line. 
And I would say that we will see uh, a much bigger disruption in the automotive industry. If you take all the capital we have in the world being invested in automotives, the utilization of that capital is between 5-6%. The rest of the time the cars are standing parked somewhere at home or other places. And uh, car sharing will definitely come as business concepts. Uh, very many in the automotive industry, they are very afraid for this change. Because when I was sitting in the uh, Forstand, the management of uh, Volkswagen, uh, we once made just a calculation. We said, if we go from a utilization factor today of 5%, and car ownership is no status anymore for a younger generation coming in. It's the transportation they need. And uh, we can go up to a utilization factor with car sharing and uh, autonomous vehicles, say to 25%. That's five times. We are manufacturing 80 million cars in the world today with 5% utilization. If we go up to 25%, we don't need more than 20 million cars in the world. That will really be the killer of the whole automotive industry. And also, also a killer of very many, let's say, of uh, the production equipment in and uh, the labor market in very, very many countries. And, but I think there is no choice. You can never stop technology. You have to go in that direction. But the consequences, I'm, I'm a bit scared <laughs> for it. Uh, especially for those countries that are dependent on the car industry, of course, obviously. Uh, I was mentioning in my introduction that, that uh, Scania is fascinating in many ways, but wha wha one way is that you have gone against the industry trends. Uh, and for one example, you haven't been that focused on economies in sca of scale, the, the volume. And I think very many are interested in that. Uh, you, you, you keep saying that doing all this acquisi acquisition doesn't really have that much point. Uh, Could you elaborate a little bit about I that? Can, uh, I, I think that the economy of scale the whole concept that's invented by business schools. Uh, and they don't understand. Consul it. Consultancy firms, maybe. Also. Uh, but mainly professors at business schools. <laughs> and uh, I have had the privilege to work with uh, one of the icons in the, uh, this, in the automotive industry, Ferdinand Piers. And we spend a lot of time um, talking about the economy of scale. And he, he told me that and we agreed after long discussions, you have to really define from an engineering point of view what you mean with economy of scale in order to understand where the scale effects are. If you take Scania, for example, we developed, before my, my predecessors, they developed a very unique um, modular system to compose the products uh, with few components, but with a huge possibility of variations to specific customer demands. So if I uh, compare with the Volvo, I did it in 2000 when we were rather close to each other, we have a quote, or uh, let's say a, a ratio, between uh, the number of parts you have in your uh, uh, product system and uh, uh, you take that uh, to the volume. We have a volume ratio of three times per pot number. Volvo is on 128 because they are not, they are so scattered in their engineering system. And when you are like that, and you add more volume, you get very little out of it. Because what you do with, when you add companies, that is, you increase the complexity, at least in the engineering industry. And uh, 
every port number in an engineering company is costing money to develop, to keep updated, uh, and also in the inventory, if you take uh, what we need to supply our vehicles with spare parts, uh, we need about, we have 25, 30,000 part numbers, but for a 10 year population, we need about 60,000 part numbers. It has been rather stable over the years. Volvo is more than half a million. So uh, I say, like, uh, I quite agree with Fred and Pierce saying it's just an engineer who can deep in, dive into the details that is able to understand what is the definition of economy of scale just for my company. <laughs> but maybe so for Volvo now they have one of your closest employers as their oh. new CEO. So. He, he works hard on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much Leif Östling. And don't go, don't go please. Uh, Uh, this uh, gift to all the speakers from Tekna is an organization called Akansha, which helps uh, people in India as an um, educational project. And uh, Tekna Transkat is a big benefiter, and now Leif Östling is that too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, this with economy of scale, be very careful. <laughs> <laughs>